So good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, Bill Keicher, who uh, has volunteered to give a presentation on a low power Earth Moon Earth amateur radio station. I, uh, I first saw one of his talks at the New England Convention, Boxborough, several years ago, and was really inspired by what he had to share for uh, those of you who are familiar with EME or Earth Moon Earth Communication, uh, you typically think of large antenna arrays uh, atop a, um, a very big tower. And I've even read that people have used anti-aircraft gun turrets to turn their EME array. Um, so for many of us, um, we feel that this type of communication is out of our reach due to cost and due to limitations of our lot. But uh, when I saw Bill's talk, I was really inspired because he shared how this could be done with uh, just one or two Yagi antennas uh, on top of a small tripod that could fit in an ordinary driveway. Um, and with equipment that, while not inexpensive, is probably not out of reach for, for uh, several of us, if not many of us. So with that as a backdrop, I thought it would be an interesting presentation for all of us to hear uh, to know exactly what you can do with a modest DME station and um, and how you can work DX, uh, provided that the person on the other end has a big gun station. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bill. The floor is yours, and I look very much to hearing what you have to say. And if you're not muted, please mute yourself unless you're speaking. Hey, thank you, Mark. Um, presumably, everybody can hear me now. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a low power earth moon earth amateur radio station. I'm going to talk about the physics, which includes the limitations for uh, working this way, the engineering, predictions on how it works, construction, and operation. The construction will also include a, a list of parts and the cost for each part. So thanks uh, for the invitation and uh, we'll continue on here. So the outline of the talk is shown here. You have to define what QRP EME is, exactly what it is. Um, it's really right on the edge. And it's interesting, you know, communication engineers talk about the Shannon limit for communication. And, and they're always trying to get as close as possible to the Shannon limit, which was developed around in the late 40s, like the early 50s. Well, it turns out that hams are used to working beyond that. The Shannon limit defines noiseless communication. Hams are used to working in marginal conditions, either because of the ionosphere or transmitter power or antenna, all of these things combined. So this is in that category, very low power, uh, as low as power as you can possibly use to work this particular problem. And I'll talk about the physics, which includes the lunar characteristics, ionospheric propagation, and antenna gain, how the antenna gain is affected by the earth. And that's important in this case. Then the engineering, which includes a description of the station in detail, and then a pretty good description of JT65B. That's the signaling format. That's, that's the uh, software that you would use to work this. It's a digital format. If you're familiar with FT8, it's FT8's grandfather, in one way to put it that way very low, uh, very weak signal type operations. And also done by uh, uh, Dr. Taylor of Princeton. So then we'll talk about EME operations, um, the measurements that were made, because you can make measurements with JT65B, modeling to see how close my calculations come to the measurements. And then the QSLs I got, I got six QSLs so far. And then a summary, which would include what the next steps would be to improve things a bit. So again, this shows very specifically what we're talking about. We're transmitting a signal from Connecticut. It's going roughly 240,000 miles to the moon. It's reflecting off the surface of the moon like a radar signal does. It's returned. The total round trip travel time is about 2.4 seconds. And that can vary because the orbit of the moon is elliptical instead of circular. And we're gonna be talking about operating two meters roughly 144 megahertz. That's where most people operate with the small stations. There's a lot of effort now going into uh, what we call X-band or 10 gigahertz, but that's, that's another world altogether, much more difficult than 144 megahertz. 
that's probably the best region to work at this time if you're just beginning. So again, what is QRP EME? We all know that QRP means low power. But in this case, this is further defined by the fact that your transmitted power is in a sense amplified, not really amplified, but there's additional gain associated with the antenna. So we have to talk about the minimum antenna, the minimum power, and in fact, operating in a single polarization. Anything beyond that uh, will work better than what we're working with, but this is about the limit on the low end. So there's a, there's a parameter called effective isotropically radiated, radiated power that radar people use. And that's basically the product of the transmitter power and the antenna gain expressed in dB. So if you had a 100 watt transmitter, that would be 20 dB WI, 100, 100 expressed in terms of 10 times the log of 100. And then you add to that the antenna gain. So if you had an antenna gain of, of 20, then you would have a total product of adding those two numbers, 20 and 20 together, you have 40 dBiW, uh, effective isotropic radiated power. So what does that mean? Well, if you had um, an antenna that could broadcast throughout a sphere into all directions, that would be equivalent of a 10,000 watt transmitter doing that. But here we have a 100 watt transmitter and the beam is I hate to use these words, but it's essentially focused or directed in a beam to illuminate the moon and also to receive the signal reflected off the moon. So now we're going to demonstrate in this talk what it takes to have a QRP EME system at two meters. So I looked in the uh, recently, I looked in the 2023 ARRL handbook, and they talk, there's a chapter there, it's a special chapter that you can that you can get. It's a digital, it's not in the paper version of the book, but it's a digital file. And they list there, Dr. Taylor lists what's required for typical EME systems. And you can see highlighted in yellow at 144 megahertz, it has the parameters there. The antenna gain, the transmitter power, 500 watts. And so the product, this number that I'm using is 48 dBiW. So what I'm saying is none of these are QRP EME stations. It turns out that I'm working with about 40 dBiW, just under that. So it's a, it's a disadvantaged station, if you will. It's really at the edge of working. So now we have to look at the moon and, and characterize it. I'm gonna, I approach this as a radar problem. It's really a radar problem. Some people use, you can use the same, the same, the same answers come from either looking at it as a radar problem or a communications problem. But since I have a background in both areas, I think this is more suited to radar because you're reflecting a signal off the moon. So therefore you have to know some of the characteristics of the moon. All right, so we already talked about how far away the moon is. The round trip travel time for our signal is gonna be almost 500,000 miles, less than 500,000 miles. So that's, that's DX in the extreme right now. You look at the diameter of the moon, it's, it's about 2,000 miles in diameter. That tells us roughly how big the moon appears to be in the sky. And that changes a little bit, but it's about a half a degree. So that means if we have an antenna that has a 40 degree beam width, it's easy to point that antenna at the moon. It's not like a laser pointer with a beam width of about two milliradians we have a beam width of on the order of 38 degrees. So that starts to relieve the requirement for tracking the moon and pointing towards the moon, or even seeing the moon for that matter, as you'll, you'll see. So the next factor is the reflectivity. How much energy is reflected by the moon? And typically people use a number of about 7.4%. And I've got that documented in some charts that follow. And it's fairly, Fairly, fairly the similar across the bands that are being used. So it's about 7%. That's pretty dark, actually. If you had a 7% reflection from a piece of paper, it would look black. So there's not much energy that's being reflected. So the next step is to calculate the median lunar radar cross-section. Airplanes have radar cross-sections between, say, 1 and 10 meters for your typical airplanes. The moon has a cross-section of 118 dBSM. That's 
seven times 10 to the 11th square meters. And that's essentially the product of the cross-sectional area times that 7.4%. So it's a huge reflector, but it's very far away. The other thing you have to look at, this is a detail again, this is a detail. Uh, what is the distribution? The, the moon doesn't always reflect according to that 118 dBSM cross-section. There are fluctuations in that. And so you look at the distribution to understand statistically how well you're gonna work. Also polarization. If you transmit linear polarization to the moon, it's reflected back linearly and whatever's incident comes back. So vertical in, vertical out. <clears throat> the microwave guys use circular polarization. And the thing there is right-hand circular comes back left-hand circular. So you need an apparatus that can transmit right and receive left. Right-hand circular is the convention. <clears throat> so this is what the cross-section looks like statistically. So you can see the median roughly here is about 118 dBSM, but it can fluctuate. It doesn't fluctuate that much, but it, it does change. And in fact, here's a new chart that I added recently. This is a radar image taken by Arecibo at 430 megahertz. And so this is the radar line of sight. <clears throat> this is the lunar north pole. <clears throat> so you're seeing roughly a quarter of the size of the moon there. And the bright spots are the sources of reflection. <clears throat> the greatest portion is right here on these lunar, so-called lunar seas, Mare Imbrium. And you can see the craters have <clears throat> enhanced reflection. They all contribute to the <clears throat> return from the moon <clears throat> and they produce a statistic that looks like this, the blue dots. So a lot of <clears throat> communications guys use this Rayleigh distribution. It's a mathematical formula that creates that. But you can see that it's closer to a Ricean distribution. And for a radar guy, that's good. That means that you're more likely to detect the signal. And what it means is there's one strong reflector the mare on the moon, and a lot of smaller reflectors. <clears throat> if you had a Raleigh distribution, a Rayleigh distribution, it would be many roughly equal reflections, sort of like um, you may have seen laser speckle. <clears throat> <clears throat> Another measurement that was made on the moon return is, does it preserve the polarization? I said it does essentially preserve the polarization and this is that, that main reflector that we're talking about. These are the other craters that are producing this, but they're way down and they occur at a different point in time because the moon is such a large object. <clears throat> and here's um, a, a bunch of measurements that were made at, at all these different wavelengths. Here we are at 144 megahertz. And we're assuming that it's about 7%, 7%. Might be a little bit less than that, but it, it varies across that. <clears throat> so now that we've established what the reflection is like, what, what happens to your polarization? You transmit, in a simple system like this, we're transmitting linear polarization. Well, it turns out <clears throat> we're looking at the moon at moonrise, and there's a reason for that I'll describe later. You can see I plotted elevation and azimuth of the moon at this time. This is when I got my first QSO. <clears throat> and I was operating near moonrise. <clears throat> you can see that the moon isn't changing that rapidly. So again, it's a relatively small angular target, about a half a degree, and it's moving less than 15 degrees <clears throat> per hour. So our antenna beam width is much larger than that. You don't have to track the moon with your uh, with a as L type mount. Okay. Another factor is that because I'm transmitting here in Connecticut and I don't know who's going to be receiving my signal, 
my polarization, if it weren't affected by anything else, just reflecting off the moon, would come back at a different angle. It wouldn't be, if I transmit horizontal, it would not be horizontal by the time it comes back. It depends on where you're located, where the receiving station is located, and it's a function of time. So you can see here, my first QSO, <clears throat> the polarization had rotated 60 degrees just because of where the moon was and where the station in Russia was at that time. And here's one in Slovenia. It's different, different location, different rotation. And <clears throat> the best way to look at that, if you're an astronomer and you've seen pictures like this, this is Polaris, a time exposure of the stars. You can see the earth is rotating and, it's, and the positions of these stars appear to be moving and they're smeared on this image. Well, in a small way, the same thing is happening with the moon. The moon is moving. And so the, its, its aspect with respect to where we are is changing. So the polarization is changing, but that's a small amount and it's fixed. But even more important is what the ionosphere, this is the limiting factor. This is the thing that kills or, or not your signal. <clears throat> if you take a linear polarization, and you run it through the ionosphere. The ionosphere has ions and electrons. It's the electrons doing the work. There's the Earth's magnetic field, which varies across the Earth. The ionosphere is not uniform. You can have sporadic E, you can have F layers. Things are coming and going with, with solar illumination. So you have this, this um, electron gas that's in a magnetic field that's going to rotate your polarization. It's what they call birefringent. In optics, it would be called birefringent. You send in a linear polarization and it turns it into circular polarization. And then exiting, it returns to linear polarization at some other angle. And that's what's sort of shown right here. What that angle is, is totally unknown. It's random because the ionosphere is random. You don't know how the ionosphere is gonna to react to this. <clears throat> So here's a calculation, just a simple estimation. This is a, 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 an approximation, actually. It's not as sophisticated as it could be because the magnetic field changes and the electron density is changing. But just taking these numbers, you can see that at two meters, we're talking about a rotation of about three and a half times. That means the polarization is rotating three and a half times. Okay, keeping that in mind, Dr. Taylor made a measurement on the polarization from his location in New Jersey out to the moon and back, same location. So there's not a geometric effect to first order other than the fact that the moon is moving. But the ionosphere is causing a major change in the polarization. This is the polarization here. It's changing 220 degrees per hour. If you're receiving horizontal and it comes back 90 degrees different, you have a loss of about 20 or 30 dB. So that can produce a fade while you're operating because this is happening on a minute by minute basis. This is just one measurement and it could very well be more than that or less than that. <clears throat> so the important point to remember is that the total polarization rotation is random. You don't know who's going to be receiving your signal, so there's a number there, and you don't know what the atmosphere is doing. So how do you treat it? And we know that the atmosphere changes. So how do you treat it? The best way to treat it is as a uniformly distributed random variable that ranges from zero to 90 degrees, because that's what's important. If it goes to 180, you're back again at zero. So zero to 90, zero, say you're transmitting horizontal, 90 would be vertical. And so that's rotating and you get more or less signal in your antenna. So another way to look at that is a roulette table, roulette wheel rather. This is essentially a device for introducing a, a, a uniformly distributed random variable, the location of where that ball lands. And in fact, if you look at it, if you ignore the green sectors, there are 36 numbers. So every 10 degrees, there's a sector that the ball can land in. That's essentially a pretty good analog for what's happening here. We don't know what the atmosphere is going to do. It could wind up with anything. But what we can do is plot for a uniformly distributed variable 
what the loss is as a function of probability. So on average, the medium or the expected value is 3 dB. Half the time it's better and half the time it's worse. And the half the time that it's worse, it can be a factor of 100 or more, 1,000 even for that matter, to go up to 30 dB loss. So that can shut you down. But you also have to remember that the polarization rotation is changing. So you might begin at one point and later on, maybe 15 minutes later, it might be better. It's likely to change is all we can say. We don't know how it's changing though, or how rapidly it's changing. Just we have a rough idea of that. So knowing that the polarization is gonna be random, that allows us to pick the polarization of our antenna. Should we use vertical or horizontal polarization? All right, this, this is solved by doing uh, easy NEC. This is software that calculates what the antenna pattern is in V and H as a function of your antenna design and its location. In this case, because I'm talking about a, a two meter antenna, I'm gonna put that one wavelength above the ground. That's two meters, roughly, you know, a little over six feet high off the ground. So I can point it. So what that means basically is, this is what a vertical polarized antenna does. You can see it lifts, this is a horizontal, it's pointing horizontally with vertical polarization. You can't get energy down low because there's, a, there's essentially a null here because what's happening, and the best way to do this, explain this is think of a, a vertical antenna, a vertical quarter wave antenna, okay? And you have a ground plane. Maybe the ground plane is defined by radials or, or other ways, but, or just a ground or a sheet of metal. But what happens is you have an image of this antenna here. So it looks like a half wave antenna that's vertically polarized. It turns out that if we have our antenna, Yagi horizontal polarized here, it's equivalent to having another Yagi antenna two meters below the ground. The quality of that antenna depends on the conductivity of the soil and the dielectric constant of the soil. So I used a modeled soil in this calculation that they use for calculating uh, antenna patterns. And so because you have two antennas, you're gonna have a null here. So it's hard to get energy down low on the ground. That's true for other antennas. I'm sure you understand that. And it's gonna be a function of the height above the ground. But this is what I'm working. We get with an antenna that typically has about 14 dB of gain, we get a slight improvement. And the, the peak is now at nine degrees. So whenever I say moonrise, the moon might be here, but really you have to catch it when it's a little bit higher than that, because that's where your high gain is on your antenna. So now we'll look at horizontally polarized. This is the same soil for this calculation. You can see we have 18.6 dB at a slightly higher angle, 12 degrees. This is what I would use, and this is what I did use because of the extra gain. This is called by some people ground gain. This is additional gain associated with the antenna basically having a relatively poor conductor underneath it, flat surface. Again, this is a model, but this gives us an idea which way we should operate. So the conclusions are for elevation angles between 10 and 30 degrees, horizontal, horizontally polarized Yagis are the best to use for this case to get higher gain. And then we know again, ionosphere is gonna change it anyway. So we'll send out horizontal. It'll come back some random polarization, but there's a trick that the QRO stations have, and we'll get to that. Unfortunately, we don't have that trick available to us at this point. So now I'm gonna talk about my station here in Connecticut. This is where I operated, this is my garage. And I would take the equipment out, place it next to the garage here with the lines running through a window, through a window feed here to the antenna. And I pointed between these trees and my neighbor's house in this development. <clears throat> and so since this is a residential area, you know, they don't necessarily appreciate our antennas. So I had to set it up and break it down each time. And I calculated what the hazard zone is. It's about 80 feet. So it's about out to here. It's not gonna create a problem. And that's if, in your, if you're in the main beam and we can see that the main beam is actually deflected upwards 
somewhat. So it's pointing up above the ground here. So that's where I operate it. This is what it looks like with a camera that takes a picture of a sphere. It collects everything in a sphere. And you can see the top of my head here. Here's the camera. This is where the moon is. This is where I'm going to catch the moon. So if I'm going to catch the moon in that location, I have to know when the moon is going to rise in that location, that azimuth, that elevation. So there's software that can be used to predict that. This is a view of the antenna on uh, a day that I got three QSOs, one right after the other. So the ionosphere was working in my favor in that case. And I don't think you can see it, but the moon is right there. You can barely see it right there. Horizontally polarized. Okay, so because of the need to avoid irradiating my neighbor's house and to get the ground gain, the combination of elevation and, and azimuth choices led to this on the 19th of January. There's a DME window. So that means that I can't go out every day and do this because the moon, because of the Earth's motions and the moon's motions, it's going to rise in a different location. Now it might have the same, roughly the same location for three days, but I'm trying to get the maximum gain out of this. And this is why I have to use the ground gain. There was one time I didn't, and it was I was just barely able to communicate with the guy. So here's a photo of the antenna and the, the garage here. You can see the antennas on a metal tripod, an MFJ tripod. I have a PVC pipe here that can rotate around this axis and can rotate on the uh, elevation axis here too. Pretty simple. You point it, you go inside and you operate. Now I was, I wanted to make sure that the VSWR was okay operating that close to the ground, that close to my house. So I measured it in situ, that is in place with a piece of equipment that uh, I would have used a VNA if I was doing this today, but I didn't have a VNA. I had another piece of equipment, a vector um, uh, SWR meter and measured the SWR here. And you can see it's pretty good. In the region I'm operating, it's around here. So it's, it's about 1.1 or so. So that's pretty good. And this is the block di diagram of the station. Um, I recently gave a talk on how to build one of these. And some of these components aren't necessarily available. For example, I, I have an ICOM 9100. In its place, you could probably use a 9700. And I think you might even be able to use a 905. Because all we're requiring is about you know, 10 to 12 watts. A 905 should generate 10 watts here. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I have a, a preamplifier located in a non-optimal position behind the power amplifier. I didn't want to blow this out with the power amplifier generating a couple hundred watts into this thing. This, this can handle 160 watts. Now, I got this from Applied Radio Research in Connecticut, by the way. They make very good amplifier, pre-amplifiers, low noise amplifiers. And they have the, the amplifiers with coax relays that are operated with a box. That is, when the RF signal is present, the amplifier, the preamp is protected by relays. When it goes away, the preamp's in position for listening. So that's what this is. So why did I do that? It's because I didn't want to use a sequencer. You can do the same thing with a sequencer by having the preamp in a better position up here, but it does risk blowing this out if the sequencer fails or isn't done properly. I didn't want to risk this. So I took the hidden noise figure here and put the amplifier here. So this is a, an amplifier that runs roughly 200 watts with about 10 watts input. And then I took into account the, lo the loss of the lines here. For the short segments, you could use RG213 because the loss is so small, it doesn't pay, sorry, the loss is so small, it doesn't pay to have a more expensive cable. This 400 max has very low loss at, at VHF. And this is a 25 foot run. So that was worthwhile having there. And then the power supplies in a computer. All right, here's what it cost in 2018. I did recost the whole thing. It was founded just after World War II. Jewish people have a history here going back 4,000. 
Okay, so <laughs> this this is the cost in 2018. The cost in 2023 is roughly the same because you don't necessarily need an antenna analyzer and the software is now free. And some of these components, the uh, transceiver is cheaper. The, if you get, use a 9700, some of these parts are, are more expensive. The antenna is more expensive, but it's first order. It's about the same, even in 2023. So uh, this antenna, by the way, I wanna point out that the antenna that I use, the M squared antenna is probably about the best you could get for the price that, that you have to pay. And here's when it's put together, this is my location and so on. H polarization, this is the gain without the ground gain. Here's the ground gain. When I'm pointing the antenna at 15 degrees elevation. So I wasn't on the maximum portion of the antenna uh, lobe. So the total antenna gain is about 16 and two thirds dBi. The noise figure because of the cable is one and a half dB. It could be reduced to half a dB or so at best. The transmitter loses power going up the cable. And we, we have already mentioned these. Okay. Now this is, um, now that we've talked about the hardware, I want to explain JT65B. It's taken a while to understand this. There's a lot going on in JT65B to be able to receive a signal. Well, let me just give you an idea of the signal levels. You've heard of watts and milliwatts and microwatts, each time a factor of a thousand microwatts, nanowatts, uh, picowatts, femtowatts, attowatts, zeptowatts. We're receiving signals that are hundreds of zeptowatts, which is incredible. How, how does that work? Well, you use a special type of signaling format, JT65B, Joe Taylor. And so the next slide shows you the format. It's called frequency shift keying. So the signal is being transmitted on tones. The number of tones in your alphabet, the English alphabet has 26 letters. JT65 has 64 tones. With 64 tones, you encode six bits for every tone. So two to the sixth is 64 different levels. That's the way to look at it. So discrete tones. Okay, now this is, this is a lot to take in. We talked about 64 tones for a 64 area alphabet. Six bits per tone. The 65th tone in JT65 is the synchronization tone. And in fact, it turns out that um, Joe Taylor and company have learned that there's probably a better way to do it because half the energy in the signal is in the synchronization tones, as you'll see. It uses forward error correction so-called low rate Reed Solomon code that was invented at MIT. And this, these are notations and I'll show you what they mean in a bit. So what's happening is you're transmitting 72 message bits, only 72 bits have information and 306 error correction bits. That's why they call it a low rate code. The data rate is low compared to the number of bits that you're sending for correction. All right, so what is forward error correction? I can give you an example, uh, just an example. Whenever a ham radio operator is on the radio running single sideband voice, and you're, you're, calling, you're using your call sign, okay, Kilo Charlie One, Hotel Tango Tango. I could say KC1 HTT, but there could be confusion. T could sound like some, some other letter, or F can sound like S. Turns out that, that hams use the international phonetic alphabet and they should always, always use the same designation because it's understood that you're encoding your call sign with specific sounds, kilo, two syllables. Half the, half the energy is going into an error correction by expanding from K, one syllable to kilo, Charlie, two syllables, one, one syllable, and so on. November has three symbols. 
three syllables, I should say. So it's an expansion. You're expanding your message. And, you, and to receive it, you need to understand what the decode is. The decode for the international uh, phonetic alphabet isn't Japan, it's Julia. It's not crispy, it's kilo. So it's important to use the proper code so your message gets through. That's what's happening here. There's an agreed to encoding and decoding. But it goes beyond that. There's interleaving. You take those 63 symbols, which contain the total of 72 bits and 306 error correction bits, and you run them into a matrix. And I'll show you what I mean by that. And you read it out in columns. So it scrambles it. So that means if you had all of your message with information up front and you had a fade, you'd lose everything. But if you scramble it, if you lose part of it, part of it, you're not losing everything. You can reconstruct it. So that's something communication engineers do. They spread the information out over the entire message, the data that is. Okay, so the, the, the convention is that you transmit on one minute transmissions. That's, that's longer than FT8, as you know. And you start one second after UTC. So you have to synchronize your computer clock which is running the software that generates the waveform. That's also true with FT8. So you have to synchronize in time. The synchronization pulses also synchronize the other guy's receiver in frequency. So there's a frequency lock, a time lock. You can see polarization is important. The code is important, decoding it properly and de-interleaving it properly is important. So that's what's happening here. Now this particular JT65B has some neat features it uses a soft decision algorithm. What, by that, what I mean is it doesn't say above a certain level, it's a one, below a certain level, it's a zero. It says, it looks like it may be a one, maybe 75% probability it's a one, 25% probability it's a zero. So the software is keeping track of all of these estimates. And then in the end, it, that's called a soft decision. It uses all of that information to come up with the best solution. So that's what that gives you two more dB over a hard decision. Then there's a very special technique that they use. This is something that you're going to have to do if you become, if you want to do EME. Even the high power guys do this. There's a file called call, call three text that has a list of 7,000 operators throughout the world. There are only about 7,000 people that have tried to do this. Some haven't succeeded, but there are about 7,000 people that have given their call sign and equipment list to this database. And it's a relatively small text file, but it has information. And that information is used by the software to decide who's actually communicating. It throws out call signs that are incorrectly dec decoded. In other words, there are call signs that of people that could be decoded that aren't on the EME list. So it will not communicate with them. The first time an operator didn't have call three text and the software was saying, call, call three text error, call three text error. I didn't know what was going on and talked to a ham who had done EME from Rhode Island. So for doing that, you get plus four dB. This is a total of six dB. That's like having four times the power that you're transmitting. And it's all done in software error correction software, soft decision, interleaving, and then the special process with this uh, deep search algorithm. So now we're gonna look at what happens to the signal. I mentioned 72 information bits per long message. So that roughly is this, this is the first QSO that I got. And actually it may let be less than 72 information bits, but the maximum it can, can transmit in a single code word, it generates a single code word it doesn't repeat the message. Single code word, 72 information bits that are encoded here into a single mess, into a single code word, and then interleave. So six bits per symbol, 378 bits for, with 12 information and 51 uh, forward error correction symbols. So here's how the interleaver works. Here's an input stream here that's moving along in time. These are different symbols, you know, frequency one, frequency two, frequency three, six each bits in each of these packages here. They're being loaded into an array, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
the readout 1472583693 you can see how it's spread out the symbols across time that makes it more resistant to fading it's an engineer's trick all right so what are the tones that are used this is a complete list of the JT65B tones here's the sync tone 275 hertz uh, from your carrier and these are all the numbers from zero to 63. Each of these is encoded as a binary number. Zero is zero and so on. Two is two. This is the frequency. You hear that frequency, you get all of these bits at once. And that's whether they're <clears throat> message bits or error correction bits. What does that look like in time? Okay, well, there's another trick that's used here. The synchronization, I said, has half the power, half the energy in the transmission. This transmission is roughly 45 seconds, well, 46.8 seconds here, from here to here. This is the, the information, I should say, the information and error correction bits. These are in separate intervals where six bits are sent here. This looks like it's two intervals, so it's 12 bits for those two. Meanwhile, over here in the... the so if you were to look at this on an oscilloscope, it would have a constant amplitude across this time, but there would be different frequencies present under that envelope. And these are some of the elements of that. And so what does that sound like? Well, it turns out the first time I operated, I mentioned how it didn't work. Uh, this is what I received, I recorded that. This is what it sounds like. This is the signal from a ham in Rhode Island. This is a return from an airplane that he's illuminating. He doesn't realize he's illuminating it and my beam is receiving. So I'm receiving both signals. You can see there's a Doppler shift here. This airplane's moving at about 370 miles an hour radially with respect to my antenna. And you can see the Doppler shift is decreasing and he eventually leaves the beam. You look at this representation, it's a cleaner representation where the Doppler shifted signal is weaker, it disappears over here. But that's that's uh, W3CJK's call sign. He's calling CQ right now to anybody. And I eventually met him person in person with his, his buddy, Jim Spears. And over lunch, about three hour lunch, they told me a lot about how to operate and the websites where you get software and so on. So we're not done yet with what's happening to the signal. The moon is moving in an elliptic orbit, which means it's getting closer and further away. And so it appears to wobble like this. This is the month of October for some year, I don't know what year. And you can see that it's moving. And that Doppler, that produces a Doppler shift. So your radio, and the, the software does it, it tracks the Doppler shift. It puts a, a constant frequency on the moon. So it knows the orbit of the moon, and it's putting a constant frequency at the center of the moon. On the other hand, the other parts of the moon are moving either forward or back, and there's a Doppler shift in the return. This is why that radar was able to form a range Doppler image. But in our case, depending on your frequency, it smears the signal. We have, we have digital filters that are receiving signals in very narrow bandwidths on the order of three, three and a half hertz. So you have to track the Doppler. That's why we're tracking the Doppler. That's why Joe Taylor has put half of the energy into that tracking, that synchronization. Well, if the signal is coming back smeared, blurred as it were, like an out of focus image, it's blurred because of the motion of the moon. It's, it's, there's gonna be energy outside of the passband and that's what's represented here. But at 144 megahertz, two meters, it's not very much. It doesn't affect things very much as you'll see. This is the performance of JT65B as published by Joe Taylor in measurements where he introduced Doppler shift. So this is a computer simulation. But whenever people say JT65 works to minus 25 dB, what does that mean? What it means is minus 25 is here. They're talking about noiseless operation. It means that, yeah, it's gonna work. It's almost guaranteed to work. 
if you can receive at minus 25 dB with reference to a 2500 hertz bandwidth, it's going to work. Well, that's like Shannon's theorem. Okay, we want noiseless communication. We want it to work all the time. Your cell phone works most of the time. We're working down here. And remember, the ionosphere is moving us around here at random. So there's a good fraction of the time we're going to get nothing. On the other hand, if you persist, you will receive a signal. You're going to see this chart at the end, end of the talk, and I'll show you how the choice of an antenna can improve things dramatically. All right, so I talked about the longhand message. That's where you're sending your, your CQ, you're sending your call sign, you're receiving a call sign and a message from the other guy. After that, it's a very simple message like FTA, uh, where you're sending Romeo Oscar or Romeo, 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 or 73. We're ending QSO. Each of these seconds or so. What does it look like? Okay, it's a constant envelope, but under the envelope, you're alternating between sync and a tone, sync and a tone, sync and a tone. So you can mathematically take, or, or even in an analog sense, you can take those and take the difference frequency. The difference frequency represents Romeo Oscar, Romeo, 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 and 7.3. There's enough signal here as you can actually see this on a waterfall display as I'll show you. That's one of the indication that it's working. And you know your, your computer will decode these um, if there isn't any significant Doppler shift, but these are pretty robust. This, these are the easiest thing to receive from the moon. And you can see here's the curve for that. So it's good out, you know, 33, minus 33 dB. That's far beyond where the other part, the longhand message fails. So it works pretty well. So what does the QSO looks like? If you're again, if you're familiar with FT8, it's very similar. These are the transmit times here, one second after the minute. It's also, and this is something that I didn't know about initially. East transmits on even minutes, west on odd minutes. The first time I operated, I was transmitting on even minutes, and the guy from Rhode Island was was transmitting on uh, odd minutes. That's why I could hear him. But if I was set up right, I wouldn't hear because we'd be both transmitting at the same time or both receiving at the same time. There's a significant interference that can occur from a station that's you know as far away as 60 miles, with even with a simple antenna like I have. So it proceeds here roughly minute, 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 and so on. And th these are the long messages here. These three are long messages. These are the shorthand messages, and the translation translation here. So these are repeated as you saw earlier. Uh, the longhand messages are not repeated. It's one time you send it. Okay, operations. The night that I had my first success, the 19th of January, this is what the moon would have looked like if I could see it, but there was cloud cover. So I couldn't even see the moon. This is a January night. It's cold outside. It's dark. You can't see the moon. I pointed the antenna with a compass and an inclinometer. That was sufficient to do the job. So you don't need you don't need an apparatus to to point the antenna. You can point it by hand, especially if it's only two meters above the ground. So there's another factor that comes into play here. We talked about where the moon is in azimuth and elevation. Well, the moon has a position in the sky that um, the sky doesn't have a uniform background with respect to noise, and the moon comes in closer and goes away further. That changes at about 2 dB or so. But if you were to point your antenna at the sun, here's the sun down here, the noise goes up because the sun is what they call a black body radiator. It's going to radiate at all frequencies from, you know, from the shortest wavelengths, I'll say gamma rays, all the way through radio waves. And there's a calculation you can do to tell you how much you're going to receive from the sun. Also, the, ga the galaxy, the Milky Way is out there, and it's loaded with stars. So if you happen to cross the Milky Way, your noise is going to go up. This is what a radio telescope does. It's looking at the noise from stars. But in our case, it's reducing our performance. So you would like to operate here. But in my case, I had to operate here because of the position of the moon. And that was still, it was still fine. It worked all right. 
So here's where the moon was. Here's where the uh, Russian station was in St. Petersburg. This is where the moon was right here over North Africa. This, here's where we are in Connecticut. With, with the moon here, you could see that I could potentially communicate with anybody that can see the moon. And that's what this curve represents. Who can see the moon at that particular time? So you can see I could talk to anybody. The distance is roughly the same. Out and back to the moon, it's still going to be a little less than a half a million miles. I mean, sorry, 500,000 miles, a half a million miles. But the difference is going to be the magnetic field of the Earth and the rotation of your polarization and who's on the air, who's operating at that frequency. So that same software, which is you can get right here uh, by this particular ham, predicts where the moon is going to be. So you can, in advance, predict you can get a spreadsheet full of angles, uh, azimuth and elevation angles in time, and know where the moon is. This is where the moon was, and this is my antenna beam width. This is the sun. This, this is the Milky Way. You can see it's a hot radio source. And what is this? This is a Mercator projection of the radio sky. So the, the planets and the Earth and the moon roughly move on this sine wave. This is the ecliptic. They move along here roughly the same. They're maybe a little bit higher, a little bit lower, but this is the path that they follow. And there's times whenever, if you were to operate here, that would be absolute worst Milky Way and the sun, if the sun were there and the moon were there. Obviously, if there's a total eclipse like there was today, if you have the sun behind the moon, that's the one of the worst cases you can have. So where you want to operate or when you want to operate is more towards a new moon. You know, we're, I mean, sorry, we're towards a full moon, not a new moon. The full moon, the moon is being illuminated by the sun and you're not in the beam width with the sun. The, your beam is in, in, the, in the sun's path. Again, this is where I'm operated, operating, looking this way. And I did this for all but one QSO. The other QSO I did, I worked this way and I had to uh, increase the elevation angle and it just barely worked. So this is what I had at the time. <clears throat> and this is the QSO. Looks a lot like an FT8 QSO. What I would do is, this is the cursor, you click on this and then, it, then you start receiving the signal. And that's what's over here. You can see his identification, Romeo X-ray 1 Alpha Sierra, and his location, uh, Maidenhead uh, locator, Kilo Oscar 59. So I was doing CQ, this guy heard me, and then it began, the message uh, QSO began. You can see here also where you have, uh, he sends Romeo, 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 sorry, I send Romeo, 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 he sent Romeo Oscar. 7373. Three. Now I said you can see these on the waterfall display. So the long message, let's see, these are the sync pulses. So you can see the sync pulses. And you can see the Romeo Oscar and 73 here. Because those signal, the signal to noise is pretty high. It's a signal that's repeated 16 times with the sync. So you're alternating a pulse here, a pulse here. And you can see it. But what you can't see is the long message, which is in here, because the tones are all spread out across this region here. You can't see it. Sometimes you can't even see these. But in this case, this is one of the best cases where I was working uh, the first time I worked. The signal to noise ratio is recorded as minus 18, which is the largest number I ever got. And the time delay was 2.2 seconds. I mentioned the time delay for the moon is between 2.3, 2.4 seconds. So that says the clocks and his radio uh, on his computer, my computer, weren't exactly right. One other thing to note is that you have to click on each of these. You know, in other words, here's his uh, signal. I have to click on this and then it would send this. It's not an auto sequence like an FT8. It's manually operating. And this is what it looks like. I mentioned the time delay here. So there's another website. This is like a, uh, a bulletin board that lists people who are interested in operating. Because you don't know what frequency people are going to operate on. Sometimes they will announce that they're going to be operating on a certain frequency at a certain time. QRV 
at 144.15 megahertz, something like that. So you can do that and people will then look for you, but you can't use the bulletin board when you're actually doing the QSO. That would negate it as a QSO. So you can send text messages before and after the QSO, but not during the QSO. So these are highlighted so that, uh, you know, he said, I'll call you. And then this is what his, uh, thanks for the QSO. And these numbers here indicate a signal to noise ratio from my radio, negative 24. I think this be, it could be the polarization angle because it's negative. But the trick that they have is that, but they can, and I'll show you how they do it. And then I said, this is the first, first time it worked and so on. So you want to get the software, this is the software for, for the um, thing where the moon is. This is what a station looks like. This is a, a big gun station. First of all, notice that he's got a cross pole connection or cross pole antenna. That means he can receive both polarizations, orthogonal polar, polarizations 90 degrees with respect to each other, this angle and this angle. Notice he's not doing this because this one would have higher gain than this. But if they're both like this, they'll both have the same gain as they approach the ground. So this configuration is favored if you have a, a cross-pole antenna. Now what they do is there's software that can take the signal from this antenna, from this antenna and put them up together coherently. As you add vectors, you can add this and, and the other one, and the sum of the two is essentially a reconstructed signal. The penalty you pay is you have 3 dB of noise extra because of two receivers working this and this, then after the fact, you combine them in the computer. So that's yet another trick. And in fact, if you've done satellites, you know, the little FM satellites, you may know that you have to rotate your antenna as the, as the satellite goes ahead because the orientation, all of this applies to that too because the polarization is rotated by the ionosphere. The satellite is moving, the satellite's antenna is rotating. You have to compensate it as you do the QSO with an, an FM, five watt FM handheld. So in this case, you look at his power aperture product, it's 53 and a half dB IW. That's certainly what uh, Dr. Taylor would recommend, but it is a QRO, it's not QRP. He also uses another piece of software called MAP65, which gives him a view of the whole band. It turns out he can see the whole band and who's operating if the signal's large enough. That's another advantage the big guns have. Now, so the point is they have all these advantages. They can turn on and almost guarantee a successful QSO with another big gun station. No problem, it's, it's almost automatic because they have such big transmitters, big antennas, polarization compensation, no, no problem. Who do they want? They want the QRP operator. They want your maidenhead locator. They want your QSL card. They want your location. So they're looking for the small operators. So these two guys were big guns. This one is from Slovenia. I got both of them roughly at the same time. You see the azimuth and elevation for my antenna. It didn't change very much. So why buy a, a rotator? Here's the EMA. This is what the EME, uh, how he was pointing. And this is the temperature of the sky for me and the range and the Doppler shift, which is zeroed out by the software and the residual Doppler width that we talked about caused by the spreading, the fact that the moon is moving like this. So, all right, so in order to predict what you're going to, how it's, well it's gonna work, you need an equation to calculate what you will receive. This is the received by static radar signal equation. You can see it has the um, effective isotropically radiated power, EIRP, the power aperture product of the guy who's transmitting. But the guy who's receiving has a part in this too because he's getting the signal. So the big gun guys have 50 dB here and we've got maybe 14 dB here. That's just the antenna receiving. There's a loss caused by polarization. We talked about that. It could range from 3 dB, 0 dB, 20 dB, 30 dB, we don't know. This is the moon. Moon is fairly well behaved. The uh, lunar Doppler shift that's taken care of, it's a small effect. 
And you can see it's a wavelength dependence. So whenever somebody, this is interesting, somebody says, I have an antenna with, with 30 dB gain. All right, what frequency is, is it? It tells you the frequency you can calculate the physical effective area of the antenna. So the gain may be high, but they lose it because the effective area is small. On the other hand, they gain because their beam width is small. So they're putting a brighter signal on the moon, but they're receiving less signal because they have a smaller capture area. There's another way of writing it that has that in it, but I didn't use that here. This is a spreadsheet that calculates. So um, I guess, you know, we, people had questions about what happens if I change my antenna. I could, the yellow are inputs, <clears throat> change the power, change the antenna gain, the noise figure of the receiver and what who's at the other end. And you get a result here. And, you know, this is what my receiver would see from him. And this is what his receiver sees from me. It's less because my transmitter power is down and my antenna gain is, is we only have one antenna. So whenever I said that we have <laughs> Zepto watts, see the received signal in watts, three times 10 to the minus 19, one times 10 to the minus 19. So remember, femtowatts is 10 to the minus 15, attowatts is 10 to the minus 18, zeptowatts is 10 to the minus 21. So we're talking hundreds of zeptowatts, which is amazing. All right, so now I've had six QSOs, and this is what I received. This is what I measured receiving. And this is the station that I went uh, above the horizon, you know, basically pointed at a, at a fairly high elevation angle. Barely worked, minus 30 dB. Well, it turns out that I think I had a problem with my preamplifier. So if I add in 4 dB here, then it pulls these numbers in a bit better to what would be predicted. But even if you ignore that, what's interesting is what do these big guns see of me? They see about the same signal. It's the same distance. If they take out the effect of polarization, they're gonna receive about the same signal. And that's what this is saying. It's a fairly tight distribution on average. It's about minus 24.67 dB. And the standard deviation is about a dB. So it's about the same. So what does that tell us? The problem is in the QRP station receiving the signal. Our signal is making it to the big guy because he's got a big antenna and he can correct for polarization. We have a problem, even though he has a high powered signal because polarization is interfering with us receiving. So whenever you have a problem and you're sitting there and nothing is happening, it's probably because the ionosphere has rotated your polarization. So that's the important thing. So how long did it take? I did this for six months. I got six QSOs and they came in groups, two one night, one, and then three. So again, that points to the fact that there's something happening in the ionosphere that's either blocked or allowed me to operate. So this is the performance curve again. This is the first time this has been shown. But QRP, you're working down here. Sometimes it's working really well, but you saw the minus 30 dB, we're down here. So we're operating in a region where there's a very low probability of decoding the message properly. That's the long message. On the other hand, he's up here with the green. He's almost noiseless. Noiseless is 100%. That means it, it works all the time. That's the essence of digital communication. If it's a high enough signal to noise ratio, i.e. above the Shannon limit, and you know, sometimes well above it, noiseless, it doesn't degrade, very unlikely to degrade. Uh, a noiseless system is defined as one bit error in 10 to the 12th. So we're only talking about 360 bits here. So we have a pretty high error rate if we're down here. On the other hand, if we add a second antenna, that is benefiting the receiver and the transmitter. On the transmit side, it helps a bit, but he's receiving it anyway. So it's not gonna make much of a difference for the guy to hear us. On the other hand, we're up here in this blue region because we've added three dB, three dB in receive. So that brings the probability of message copy up to around 80%. So it works a lot better. 
it's not noiseless. We're still, you know, we're still having a problem with the ionosphere, but that 3 dB has made a big difference. So that's something that I've got to try to see if that really works. This is a prediction. This has not been validated. This is sort of what we have from this red line and the green are what I have from six QSOs, limited data, but this is an extrapolation. Add 3 dB and it gets a lot better. This is a very steep curve. These error correction uh, algorithms have very steep curves. They either work or they break or somewhere in between. So these are the QSL cards that I got. And here I've outlined the, uh, or highlighted the power aperture product. And you can see here, here's an interesting point. Instead of saying, uh, you know, what, what's the received signal? You put in Oscar with quotation marks. That's, the, that's the, the standard for a QSL card with EME. You put Oscar quotation mark. That means I've received your signal sufficiently. Remember with digital communications, when you're running, noiselessly, signal to noise of, of 15 d, minus 15 dB, it's working just as well as minus 10 or minus 20. It's working. So Oscar. This is uh, the second one, same night. Again, very high power aperture product, confirmed on OTW as well as uh, QSL card and Oscar. Oscar again. <clears throat> And um, also got an EQSL. And this guy, 57 and a half dBIW, an enormous antenna array. I barely was able to receive this guy. I didn't have the ground gain because I was pointing up maybe 30 degrees. So the antenna was, and also probably the, the uh, low noise amplifier wasn't working properly, but just barely received it with this huge system. This is, you know, 10, it's five times 10 to the fifth watts EIRP. And Netherlands, you can see the report is Oscar. Also confirmed, fortunately, LOTW. And then England. So this one, the guy actually wrote down the, the uh, signal to noise ratio here. He is Oscar, but he was good enough to write minus 2060 B. That's what you can expect for us transmitting to them or anybody that has a big antenna and polarization, adaptive polarization. You have 52 and a half dB. And then the Spanish station, 56.9. Uh, this is a, an EQSL card. And then summary. Okay, we've talked about the physics. You can see how important the, the ionosphere is. It drives your design. You want this to work, you have to have enough antenna to get through on transmit. They, they have their own way of helping out the process, but on receive, you're on your own. You have to deal with what the ionosphere is going to deal with, deal to you. So six QSLs during this time across six months, working into the summer. <clears throat> and so I had my uh, plus 39 dBIW, and you need somebody with about plus 50 dBIW for it to work. So <clears throat> future work, what would I do if I could uh, work on this tomorrow? Add a second antenna, 3 dB. You can see how that potentially, at least predicted, potentially improves the performance significantly in the message decode rate. But you're still affected by Faraday rotation, so it's not perfect, but it's gonna go a long way. You know, raising it from maybe a 50% chance was what it seems like it was for me to maybe 80%, something like that. Another thing you could do is you could use two antennas like this separated by about 10 feet. I've done antenna simulations. You receive uh, this polarization, which is a mixture of V and H, and this is V and H, but they're orthogonal, 90 degrees to each other. You receive those two and you can switch one to the other. In other words, if one isn't working, switch to the other. The other one might be working. You won't have all the ground gain that you would have if you did this, but you would at least have the diversity to say, okay, this one's working better than that. I'll receive on this one. That's what that's about. And then finally, you could build an adaptive polarization receiver. And the heart of that would be, I think, an SDR play RSP duo, which is a two-channel software-defined receiver 
which does do combine the polarization vectors. And I tested that in, a, in an experiment at home in my basement. I took a, a, a two meter signal, split it into two portions. And if you're familiar with the old general radio tap delay lines, they have lines that are, you get them on eBay, that are hollow, they're air lines that you can change the dimensions of, so you can tune. So I, I took this, split the signal, had one path fixed and I tuned the other one, I changed it. And you could see the vector sum, there's a display on the, on the software for the RSP Duo that you could see the vector change. So it was adding the two in a vector sense. It was adding both signals from two separate receivers that have the same local oscillator. So you could add them amplitude and phase. And so that's how that works. So we're closing now and I just want to acknowledge the fact that this is hard to do on your own. If you're just starting out, you can try. And what really helps is if you've got Elmer, somebody that you can talk to. And although this is in 2018, I started on this. Talking to Dennis, we did satellite communications, you know, the five watt FM communications. And Ed Bicknell, he's another physicist. We talked about all different types of things. Finally, I met two EMEers, both from Rhode Island, had lunch with them. They clarified everything. And one month later, I was doing uh, EME. And then finally in January, uh, Dr. Marshall, he has a, an incredible system. These guys have intermediate systems. This is an incredible system he's got in Texas. And he, you know, basically discussions with him about EME. So at this point, if there are any questions, you can email me, I'm on Gmail. And I also have a YouTube channel where all of this winds up. I have uh, a number of presentations already there, including the one my son videotaped uh, in Massachusetts. So any questions? Well, thank you very much, Bill. I, I do have a couple. Um, first of all, fantastic presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, just, uh, just as good, if, well, if not better than uh, the one I saw earlier and, and a lot of uh, new information. Um, my first question, um, so, you had run some calculations for me on a um, 13 element uh, two meter beam that I happen to have two that I got at, uh, at um, uh, well, was race on before, but CCARS auctions as well as uh, uh, a friend gave me one. But um, I'm looking on M2's antenna page and I am seeing that they have two meter cross polarized Yagi's, one with effectively seven elements. It's called a 14, but they're, they're doubling up the horizontal yeah. and the vertical. Mm -hmm. And then another with, um, I think it was uh, 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 11, 11 elements effectively. And these don't, these don't require the um, uh, trusses to hold the thing together. So it might work fine on a, on a tower, you know, a little ground mounted uh, tripod or what have you. But would that be a better investment if somebody were just getting started? Would that be a better investment than the corresponding um, uh, straight polarized Yagi antenna? Okay, the first question is, <clears throat> what is the gain of, of one of those antennas? Do they mention what the gain is for one of they those? They do. Um, I'll go with the smaller antenna. Uh, the gain is 12 dBi, 12.3. Yeah. See, the antenna I used was, for, you know, for the design that the claim was 14.3 uh, or so DBI, well, uh, DBI. So, and I'm right on the edge. So there are other factors to include, for example, where you place the preamplifier. Remember, my noise figure was about one and a half dB. If I were to venture to move that closer to the antenna on the other, you know, close, avoid all that cable loss, that might pick up another dB there. And then, you know, operating over the ground, you know, you're going to get another 3 dB or so, roughly. But it might be worthwhile to, you know, to run easy NEC. If you can, um, you know, send me some of the information, I can take a look at that and see what, what happens. Yeah. You know, if I were to do this again, if I yeah. were to do this again, I would have gotten a cross-pole antenna. Because I've done calculations for two uh, antennas like I have right now. And I have to have them separated by about 10 feet using 
a non-conductor. So I don't interfere with the antenna patterns. So right. that non-conductor, you know, I looked at, okay, let's use uh, PVC. Well, PVC warps like this. It just sags. That's yeah. no good. So what the answer is, and I, you know, I did the calculations and all that, and I have the calculations, I could send them to you. Fiberglass, a two-inch fiberglass pipe that's 10 feet long is very stiff compared to PVC. Yeah. It has a certain wall thickness. You can do all of that. You can calculate what the sag is for the weight that you're putting on either end. There's still going to be some sag, going to be a catenary, but it's only it's not going to be that significant compared to the wavelength involved. So that's the best I can do right now. But if I could have done it from scratch, I would have I would have preferred to have a dual polarized antenna. And if you can get two dual polarized, I mean cross polarized antennas, you get two of those, then you're going to be you know you'll be able to do the switching, and potentially even someday even summing the two in a vector sense. You'll need a power combiner. Right. And I have one of those. You can get them from M squared. You know, it's basically uh, 50 ohms in, 50 ohms out. You can also build one with coaxial cable using a combination of 75 ohm cable and 50 ohm cable in certain lengths. And it, it'll work at certain wavelengths. It works. But it's, it's, I'm not sure about the losses involved and, you know, they have to be able to handle the power. They probably can handle the power, but I have a, a little graphic that shows you how to do that. But uh, yeah, so you'll need to do the power combining to use more than one antenna. Yeah. And if you use, and so if you have the two cross pole, it's like having four antennas and you could do, I mean, you, you can get a, an RF switch that's activated by DC voltage uh, running up the cable, for example, and you can switch you know, v, uh, just say VH, VH, or, or this one, or this one. So you can do that. But the key is find out what the, what the basic antenna gain is to start with and see how that can work into this equation. Remember, we're looking at uh, a gain product, uh, power uh, gain, uh, antenna gain product, aperture product of about 40 dBiW. Yeah. And then, you know, so that was 40 dBiW before you introduce the ground gain. The ground gain adds another 3 dB, which is good. Yeah. But so, you know, you have to be careful because, you know, you might wind up with something that may not work or it will only work a smaller fraction of the time. You do need perseverance to do this because, you know, I set up, you do all the calculations. You say, okay, today I'm going to go out. It's freezing cold. I'm working from my garage, unheated garage. I have to set, that up, set it up and break it down the same night. Uh, when it was in May, that was no problem. You know, set it up and you can go outside and it was in the daytime as you saw. So the moon moves around so you can pick when you want to operate, but it will be defined by the local geography, whether there's a building or trees and, and where the moon is gonna rise and where it's gonna set. And then ultimately what the background noise is. You have the galaxy behind you or the sun behind you. Uh, you know, you have to avoid those. So all of those factors have, have, have come into play when you're planning. So I have a separate presentation on building a system like this. And that was given at the, uh, the QSO Today talk. Mm -hmm. I have that, I have that, but I'm not gonna put it online until they've taken their stuff offline because right now they're charging 15 bucks to see the whole conference. And it, it would sort of be undermining what they're doing if I put my stuff on. So I can wait till they, you know, until they, they've gone, now I can put it on, it'll be on the YouTube channel. Or we could give a special presentation if you want. It's a shorter presentation, it's a half an hour. It covers uh, some things with a lot less detail, but it's more oriented to how do you set up, you know, which websites, uh, the preparation, the calculations you've got to do to figure out where the moon is, things like that. Okay, very good. The, um, the uh, 11 element version, effectively the 22, uh, has 14.4 dB. So that might be a yeah, that sounds good. That's a choice. Good. Yeah. It's 850 bucks though. So it's not cheap. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, if you want to yeah. do it, um, yeah. as I like to say, it's a lot cheaper hobby than boating could be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is fun. This is hard to do. That's why it's fun. Yeah. Everybody can do it. It's hard to do. Yeah. My second question, could you go back to in my last one? Can you go back to the slide that had your call sign and the number of um, the number of bits? 
because something didn't make sense there. I'm sure there's a simple explanation that I am missing. Yeah, um, yeah the number of bits, right? You'd think, okay, well, if it's encoded like an ASCII 2 character, there's more bits than what he's doing something. So you, you, you have, um, well, basically I'll get to my question. You have six characters in your call sign, six yeah. bits per character, but you said it was only 28 bits. So I'm wondering why it's not 36. Yeah. I looked at that and I was trying to figure out how he stuffs this into 28 bits. This is what he states. He doesn't state how he does it. If you were to look at, you know, ASCII two characters, which are, you know, you have a lot of different characters, you have ones and zeros and all of this stuff. It's eight bits per character. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I'm assuming it's, I'm assuming it's caps only. And that's how you're able to preserve a couple of bits and there are no symbols. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm wondering if you have six, six characters and there's six bits each, how is that only 28 bits? I don't know that, but this is what he has stated. He said, you know, this, there's a message block encoder that takes this message and stuffs it into 72 bits. He said 28 bits, 28 bits. Now this, has fewer characters than my call sign. And there's only uh, four characters here with 15 bits. And then there's this mysterious one bit left over. This is what he said. I don't know exactly how he gets Kilo Charlie One Hotel Tango Tango into 28 bits, unless he's saying that on average it's 28 bits, but he's only got 72 information bits. This is fixed. Yeah, okay. It's fixed by this, you can see on the you know, on the rotation. on the grid square it makes sense because the first two are always going to be letters and the second two are always going to be numbers so maybe he's getting fewer bits out of it because there's a predetermined subset of characters that anyway it's just i'm being a little bit too much of a computer nerd here but it uh it no, struck that, me as that, strange you hit, you, you hit a point that stumped me too i don't know how he does that yeah and you know so that's this box here, this black box here that's doing the magic, and then it goes into a relatively conventional Reed Solomon encoder. Okay. And it creates one word. It creates one word from all of that. And it's, um, you know, 378 bit word and that's transmitted once. Yeah. I remember yeah. talking to my, my brother in law. I said, I was talking about this. He said, Oh, yeah, you transmit over and over again. No, it transmits it once. All right. One chance to decode it. Well, he is a genius and he's not a Nobel laureate for nothing. So um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Any other questions from, uh, from folks? Now's, the, now's your chance. And you have to take yourself off mute. I've muted everybody. So if you're trying to speak, take yourself off mute. Anybody? Not hearing anything. Well, there's a lot of information there. And, you know, we're around, we're over in pocket talks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, know, you want to try to set something up or you want to see me operating? One of the questions I got from the QSO Today people was, when's the last time you operated? And I said 2019. That was the anniversary of the 50th, uh, 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon. And, you know, it takes a lot to do this. And I had achieved it. And from that point, I've been thinking about this. And, you know, COVID interrupted everything. And, but it, it, it's still intriguing. I, I agree. It's the, it's, it's one horizon in radio that I have not yet crossed, but I would like to do so uh, in my lifetime. So I am, yeah, I may even have all of the equipment to do it as we discussed, uh, uh, yeah. but I am, I am considering getting the amplifier as you had recommended. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would use a sequencer and get my mass mounted preamps right at the antenna, but I, yeah, I hear you, you don't want to risk point. popping one. Actually, one question I have for you, my 9100 is one of the versions that has the ALC issue. I don't know if yours has the ALC issue, but I'm a little yeah. bit leery of getting an expensive amplifier, putting it on the other end of that radio and then having it pop. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've heard about that problem. And in fact, um, one of the my Elmers, the, the uh, 
I guess it was Bill Corbin. He has he had a 9100. He used the 9100 and he mentioned that to me. But I haven't seen any problem yet. I haven't tried to make a measurement with you know an oscilloscope. Yeah. Taking a sample of the signal to see if there's a, the idea is that or at least the thought is that there's a spike when it first comes Correct. on and the spike can damage things. Well, one thing I'm doing is I'm only running you know a peak supposedly 10 watts out of that. I'm not sure what the peak would be, but it, you know it, it seems my preamp I believe has survived. You know, at least the first two QSs. No, it's your amplifier that you worry about. The the amplifier yeah. that's taking a max of 10 watts in and throwing uh, 250 out. It, in my case, I know it's happening because I have a um, I have an Alpha 9500 that I use on HF, and it's got those the, those bar graph meters and. Uh, when I use it with about 35 or 40 watts out to get the legal limit, on the first syllable of my single sideband transmission, it will show that it's putting out like three kilowatts. Uh, you yeah. know, just just for a a split second, it pegs the the output meter, and that has to be because the the radio is throwing 100 watts in for just a few milliseconds, and it's it's able to pick that up. So I'm a little bit leery of sticking a sensitive VHF linear on the output of that thing and and popping it because it's overdriven. Um, anyway, that's how yeah. I know I have the problem. Yeah, I, I could ask Bill Corbin again. <clears throat> yeah. He has, you know, he's gone on to X-Band. He's, he's, he's got many, many QSOs. Right. We know that he has a 90, he has a 9700. That's, you know, and he works, <clears throat> he uses that, but I think he primarily used it for the uh, you know, 1200, well, 1240 or so megahertz. Yeah. And then he does X band. I'll have to ask him what he's doing at 144 now. He's still working 144, but he could work that with the 9700 also. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll figure, we'll figure it other, out. The other interesting thing is a 905 looks like it might be able to drive it almost to the point where that was being driven. Yeah. Because it has 10 watts. Yeah. That would make an interesting system. Yeah. Yeah, if I can make a quick comment. Go ahead. The uh, early flex radios and most of the ICOMs all have the full power spike at key uh, issue. Uh, go ahead and Google it. You'll find all kinds of write-ups on it. But uh, what happens is that full power spike for just a few milliseconds uh, very easily punctures the junction on the solid state amplifiers. So uh, if you've got a radio that'll put out 100 watts and your amp only needs 10, you're probably going to blow up the amp the first time you key up. See, this is what I'm worried about. And these amps aren't cheap. They're about 900 bucks. And the last thing I want to do is pop it uh, okay. because my radio is being stupid. Uh, it, this is a well-known issue with the 9100. And I had it in for work to the guy in Michigan who does the ICOM service. And I asked him if he could fix it. And he said, um, ICOM stopped doing that, that uh, replacement a while ago. And you basically have to replace the radio now is what I understand, which is unfortunate. Well, even the, uh, the uh, new IC7300s uh, uh, do it quite severely. Yeah. So they, they haven't solved the problem yet. And there's a lot of people complaining about it. Uh, what I've done on my amplifiers is installed a uh, 10 dB attenuator. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Right at the input to the first uh, amplifier transistor, so that my my uh, rig has to run full power now, right. and then the attenuator burns up all the unneeded energy, and the amplifier isn't harmed by yeah. uh, whatever the uh, rig throws at it. That may that may be the right way to solve the problem. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I've I've been there and had that problem and had to spend a lot of money to fix it. So right. uh, I know it's real. Be careful, guys. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned the seventy three hundred. I had I had an operating six hundred watt power amplifier <clears throat> HF, and it's no longer working. It just failed one day, but it could have been because of the seventy three hundred. Yeah, um, Google the uh, uh, the issue. You'll find just all kinds of write-ups on it.
Well, one other thing about the power amplifier, if you choose to go and do that, there are different power amplifiers. The question I had was, um, somebody asked about power amplifiers that have preamps in them already. And uh, MFJ, you know, Mirage is a, a two meter amplifier that has a preamp, a low noise preamplifier. But if you read the specifications very carefully, it, I'm not sure if it can do long duty cycles. And if you look at the amplifier I have, the one, uh, the RM Italy, it has a fan on it, on the heat sink. And so far that's been okay. But I don't know if the Mirage would be able to handle, you know, the long transmissions, 46 second transmissions going on for, you know, five, six minutes. Yeah, that's full duty cycle when you're doing that. It's uh, you're, you're in SSB mode, but you're you're keying that thing hard. I mean, it's basically like radio teletype. Um, uh, with uh, yeah, I've um, I've noticed when I do FT8, that's full duty cycle. My amp is cranking when I need to use the amplifier, uh, full tilt. Yep. Yeah. Other uh, other questions. Remember to take yourself off mute if you're asking. Okay, well, you had a good audience tonight, Bill. I, I looked, I, I think it, it was between 30 and 40 people. I, I go on to a second screen of faces. So and I clicked over and um, that's my quick estimate. I'm sure there's a way to look at number of participants in Zoom, but really um, thank you for uh, the, the talk, uh, very educational. And um, I, I know some of the theory was a bit deep, but it, it is recorded. I will make it available. Go back and watch the parts that you might've missed. And as Bill said, he's available on, uh, on email if you have questions as well. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll get something like this set up at some point. Um, I also have to look at my area. Uh, I've got trees all behind me and I've got houses on either side of me. And so uh, I, I probably have to work at reasonable elevation, maybe 20 degrees to, to clear the trees anyway, uh, in a direction that's far away from houses. So uh, I have to see whether or not this is something I can even do on my lot, but... Um, yeah, it's something that the neighbors, you know, I, I had to take my antenna down. Didn't want the antenna, you know, the neighbors to see that and say, what are you doing? And all this. Oh, my neighbors know about my hobby, so that's not going to be a problem. I, I I don't want to irradiate them. I mean, you've got 10,000 watts of effective radiated power coming out of the out of the beam. But um, yeah, my 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 concern is with not irradiating them and also ensuring that in the directions I can point and how much do trees attenuate the signal? Yeah, they do definitely attenuate the signal. And, and um, it's interesting because if you look at what the US Army uses versus what the Air Force might use in terms of communications on the ground, they use FM and it typically ends around, I think around 75 megahertz or so. Yeah. They don't, they don't go way up, you know, they don't go to UHF. Aircraft, you know, I guess antenna size is certainly important. You know, that this is in the old days. I don't know what they're doing now, but UHF was what they were operating on. So the attenuation is higher at higher frequencies. Sure. And it's, it, it's I don't think you can just say it's a, a geometric blockage, but it's something you can probably look up. At one point we were looking at millimeter waves and they have a problem with foliage too. Yeah, you know, at work that is. <laughs> well, like like you said, the problem is being able to hear. So I could always set up with what I've got and see if I can copy any right. signals. So right. that that is important, right? If you can hear them, they can probably hear you. It's very yeah. likely they'd be able to hear you. One other thing that I learned doing all of this is that the ionosphere is birefringent, which means that it's in a splits of polarization that yeah. and rotates it. It also at HF what's happening and you can find, you know, you get enough books, there's a series of books on, on, on propagation. It splits even the HF and it gets less and less significant at the lower frequencies. But what it means is your antenna that's transmitting vertical from your house, like I have a vertical, it might be horizontal over in Italy and vertical over in Africa. Right. The paths are different because they're going through a different part of the ionosphere. 
So it can actually, it can propagate differently. The optical equivalent is if you took a laser, if you have a calcite crystal, it's by, it has two indices of refraction. It's birefringent. You can see two images. If you put it over, uh, over a written page, you'll, you'll see double image. If you get a laser, you run it through it, you'll see two beams come out. And it's because of the different index of refraction. Right. So it's kind of neat, but you know, I didn't, I didn't come across that until I started looking at this in detail. Right. The ionosphere is birefringent. Well, I'm not a physicist, I'm a chemist, but I can certainly appreciate all. Of, I did have to take quite a bit of physics uh, for, yeah. uh, for, for my degrees. So uh, I, um, I do know a little bit about what you're talking about. So it sounds and good. You have, you have certain molecules that are rotate polarization and right. Yeah, I, I did a lot of X-ray crystallography when I was in graduate school, and uh, yeah. I'm certainly familiar with birefringence and and uh, chiral uh, chiral compounds exhibiting birefringence in, in crystals and plain polarized light and being able to see extinction. And, yeah, so it's yeah. all uh, it's all there, but uh, applied in a different way. Right. Okay, last call. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks, thanks everyone, for attending. I'm going to attempt, I'm going to stop the recording now.